risen. He is risen indeed. My name is Corey Arnold, and I'm the Minister of Youth here at Grace Bible Fellowship Church. Happy Easter to you and your family. I have a few announcements to share with you. We hope you have enjoyed the daily readings and recordings from Holy Week. It was a great joy for the staff to share with you and to read through the same chapters in John's Gospel. If you want to continue reading together as a church, there is a plan that is available each week. In the weekly update that is emailed on Mondays, a scripture reading plan is included. This is a great way for us to continue to be connected through reading God's Word. So check out the weekly update and the reading plan tomorrow morning. We will pick up fireside chats again this week, but they will have a slightly changed focus. On Tuesdays, Pastor Tim and I will be answering questions about the life of the church. Do you have a question that you would like a pastor to answer or a question relating to the life of our church? Please send those questions to me as we plan to discuss those on Tuesdays. On Fridays, Pastor Ron will be starting a series looking at the Beatitudes. So look for those messages on the website or the church app on Tuesdays and Fridays this week and the weeks to follow. He is indeed risen. Please remove any distractions so we can worship the risen Christ. Good morning. I'm Pastor Tim, the assistant pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. Let's read our call to worship together this morning. This morning's call to worship comes from Luke chapter 24. Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful. We are very excited this morning that we can come and we can say we are sure that he is risen and that he lives. We thank you for this, knowing that it is because of this that you have brought us salvation. And so we seek to praise you with who we are and what we say this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is from John chapter 20. I ask you to follow along as I read verses 1 through 18. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had re reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. But the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word. We hear that this wonderful account of the risen Christ, we recognize that the disciples 
did not understand at first, but upon seeing you and upon seeing that you were gone, they believed. And Lord, we are so thankful that they were only the first, so thankful that it was not required to see you risen in the flesh to have to believe. Lord, we are thankful that you have given it to us to believe, knowing that it's, it's not because of any great wisdom that we have in ourselves, but because you have shown us yourself. We praise you for this, Lord. On this Resurrection Sunday, this Easter morning, we are more encouraged than ever, knowing that we have life through your Son, knowing that we have hope of a future, knowing that Christ is risen, and that because he lives, we will have everlasting life if we believe in him. Lord, we thank you for this and ask your blessing upon this sermon, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, my dear brothers and sisters. He is risen. He is risen indeed. I invite you to open your Bibles to the 20th chapter of John's Gospel. On this glorious Easter morning, I would like to speak to you about sight. I want to speak to you about sight from the perspective of John the Apostle, who was an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I would like us to examine how John became a believer that Jesus had risen from the tomb. And then when we come to the end of this message, I want to ask you a simple question. Do you see as the apostle John saw? We've just heard John's account of the resurrection from John chapter 20, concluding with Mary Magdalene announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Her statement is for John as the writer of the fourth gospel, a turning point. And for the remainder of John's gospel, we have the risen Jesus instilling hope in those who were without it. He shows himself alive to Thomas, yes, doubting Thomas, and Thomas ends up responding, my Lord and my God. He restores Peter, who had three times denied even knowing the Lord. He restores him with simple commands like, Peter, feed my sheep and you follow me starting with Mary Magdalene and then proceeding to Thomas and finally to Peter, John interweaves these short vignettes of how seeing Jesus alive changed everything. He does this to remind us that the resurrection matters. The fact that Jesus was dead and then was alive again made all the difference to men who were then willing to surrender their own lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message of the resurrection is that seeing is believing, provided you see with the right kind of vision. You can see and not see. Sometimes the same person can one moment see with no effect at all, but then later come back and see in such a way that seeing is indeed believing. And that's what happened with John. See this with me as we study our text for this morning, which is the first 10 verses of the 20th chapter of John's Gospel. This section of John's account of the first Easter begins in the darkness of night and death and ends with John believing in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. A setting of darkness and gloom. It's the first day of the week, Sunday. Jesus has been in the tomb since Friday afternoon. It is a secure grave. No one's getting into the tomb, and no one's getting out, or so we think. Mary Magdalene, while it is still dark, approaches the place where Jesus is buried. And something must be clearly understood. Mary is not going to the grave to see a risen Savior. She's going to anoint a dead body. Mary has no expectations whatsoever that Jesus will rise from the grave. For after all, she had seen him die on the cross. He was dead. And she was there when others took Jesus' body down from the cross. And he was dead. She went to see where his body was laid, in a tomb that was owned by Joseph of Arimathea, according to John 19, Joseph and Nicodemus took Jesus' dead body down from the cross and prepared it for burial. We get a picture of what this was like by reading all the gospel accounts of the resurrection. 
Jesus was wrapped in linen strips, not a shroud, but strips of linen wrapped around the body. And amidst the wrappings, Joseph and Nicodemus interwove aromatics like myrrh and aloes. Along with the linen wrappings around Jesus' body, a face cloth was wrapped around the top of his head. Mary knew this because she was there, and he was dead. Matthew and Mark tell us that Mary Magdalene and other women had seen where Jesus was laid. They had sat opposite the tomb, which was cut into the side of a hill and sealed by a large rock rolled in front of the entrance. So she knew where the tomb was, and very early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, she came, came bearing spices, probably thinking that the anointing of Jesus' body was not yet complete. This was an act of love, but it was not an act of hope, for Jesus was dead. Mary, who is known as Mary Magdalene, or the Magdalene, because she was from a village in Galilee, was utterly devoted to Jesus. She had followed him for a long time. Luke tells us that Mary was part of a small cadre of women who supported Jesus and his disciples financially. Now, why did she do that? She utterly believed in who he was and what he stood for, and she owed, personally, she owed Jesus quite a deal, for she had a bit of a dark secret. She had been demon-possessed by not one but seven demons, and Jesus had rescued her. He had cast out seven demons from her, and she owed him everything. So her act on this dark morning was not an act of obligation. It was an act of love. But it was not an act of hope, for Jesus was dead, and dead is dead. She wasn't expecting anything but to find the body of Jesus and to complete the anointing of his body for burial. But as she came to the tomb, verse 1 tells us that she saw something. This is the first of four uses of the word saw in these first 10 verses of John 20. John is onto something. He wants to emphasize the importance of seeing, and Mary saw. Specifically, it says she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Her eyes processed something and sent a message to her brain. This is a way that we see, and it's valid. But it's also just the most basic way of seeing. And in the language in which John wrote, Greek, John just uses the most basic word for seeing. He's saying that she observed that the entrance to the tomb was open. And from what she saw, she drew an immediate conclusion. And she needed to call in help for something very distressing in her mind had happened. So she ran. She left the tomb and ran back to where Simon Peter and another disciple were located. In verse 2, the second disciple is called the one whom Jesus loved. Simply John's humble way of identifying himself. John is the one whom Jesus loved. But hear Mary's urgent message to them. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. There are two things that must be noted here. First, that Mary wasn't alone. We know that from the other Gospels, that other women accompanied her to the tomb of Jesus. But here we note the presence of others simply by the use of a simple plural pronoun, the pronoun we. We do not know where they have laid him. But here we also note uh, that they had gone to the grave together, Mary and some other women, with the idea that perhaps they could together move the stone. But the stone is not there. That's what Mary sees. And we learn from the other accounts that an angel had rolled the stone away. Now, John doesn't mention that detail, but he tells us what Mary saw. And he tells us what she assumed based on what she saw. But remember that she was grieving. C.S. Lewis once said, you can't see anything properly while your eyes are blurred with tears. Based on what she saw, Mary made a reasonable assumption. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Mary's not thinking resurrection. She's thinking robbery. You know, many think of ancients as superstitious people. But here we see that Mary wasn't. She was very much a realist. 
She thinks the body of Jesus has been stolen away, and by they, she means Jesus' enemies. They wanted him dead. They made sure he was dead. And now in her mind, they have stolen the body. So her sight produces the conclusion that he has been stolen, and she runs from the tomb, frantically seeking help. She can only see so far, it seems. John's first glance. Starting in verse 3, Peter and John race to the tomb. Peter is the de facto leader of Jesus' disciples, but John is probably younger and a bit more agile, and he gets there first. And we read in verse 5, And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. John goes beyond simply seeing that the stone was no longer at the entrance, and he sees something else. He sees the linen cloths that had been wrapped around Jesus' body. And he notices that those cloths are just lying there. This is no small detail, and John sees as much. He notices. What John says here is that the wrappings are not disturbed. They're just lying there in an orderly fashion. And John intends for us to make a comparison simply by this. You'll remember that John has already told us about the raising of Lazarus. You'll remember from John 11 that Lazarus had been dead for four days. And when Jesus called Lazarus out of the tomb, Lazarus came out. He too had been wrapped up in linen strips. And when Lazarus came out, his hands and his feet were still wrapped in the strips. It was anything but orderly. But not so here. And John makes note of this though it's easier to see in the original language of Greek than it is here in English. But the point of John's observation by what he saw is that there is a clear difference between Lazarus' body and what we find here. First, there is no body. There are only linen and cloths which have been wrapped around Jesus' body. But the thing is, the cloths are not strewn about. They're... Um, they're not around the tomb. They're not thrown around. They're in a neat pile. And this contradicts the very idea of a burglary or a break-in. For an, if, it, if an enemy had come to steal Jesus' body, they wouldn't have taken the time to neatly arrange the linen cloths. They would have just thrown them around. But there's something more than that. There is an order to the cloths. They're arranged in such a way as to have not been unwrapped. It's as if well, what? It's as if the body had come through the cloth, just passed through them. So what has happened? In his resurrection, Jesus has passed through the linen cloths that have been wrapped around his body. You know, later on Easter Sunday, he's going to do the same thing again as he passes through the wall of the upper room. He will enter the locked room where the disciples were without unlocking the door. But the thing is, at this point, John really can't see that. He can see the absence of a body, but it hasn't crossed his mind that Jesus has risen. And the word that John uses, this is John writing about himself. At this point, it's the same word that he had used to describe Mary's vision in verse 1. Stooping to look in, he saw. He glanced. He took a cursory look. But he couldn't yet see that Jesus was no longer dead. What Peter saw. When John backed out, Peter came in. And verse 6 tells us Peter went into the tomb. And we're told that he saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. John uses, deliberately uses a different Greek word to describe how Peter saw, and it differenti differentiates what Peter saw from what Mary saw, what John saw. To this point, John has just been describing basic sight to, to look at, to glance at. But that's not what he says Peter does. The word John uses for Peter means to examine closely, to gaze intently at. The word John uses gives us our English words theory and theorize. To theorize is to think with depth, 
It is the seeing of discovery. It is a more intent way of looking, looking with deep consideration of what I'm seeing and what it means. That's what Peter is doing here in verses 6 and 7. And what did Peter see? Well, he saw more evidence of the resurrection. He didn't see the body, but he saw what John saw, and he saw something else, too. He saw the linen wrappings in orderly fashion, not unwrapped, but lying there as if someone had left them from the inside out. And he also saw the face cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. There, there are a couple of possibilities to what John means with his precise flowing Greek. John's Greek has an eloquence to it. His Greek is very precise and purposeful. So what does John mean by what he's telling us about what Peter had seen? What exactly did Peter see? Well, he could mean that the face cloth was separate from the linen cloths that had been wrapped around Jesus' body, in the same the way that when Jesus was prepared for burial, for there was a space left between the body wrappings and the head covering. His neck and the lower part of his face would have been left uncovered. And now we see the face cloth, and it's separated from the orderly linen wrappings at about the same distance that the Lord's body would have been separated from the higher part of his head. That is entirely one possibility. The Greek allows for that. But John's language suggests something more than even just what we read in English, that it was, in a sense, folded up or even twirled. More accurately, in D.A. Carson's words, it had been neatly rolled up and set to one side by the one who no longer had any use for it. So what has happened is that our Lord has risen from the grave, physically, bodily, and he has taken the face cloth aside, perhaps even twirling it in its original turban-like form, and he set it down. Why? Because he didn't need it anymore. Face cloths are for dead people. And to quote the angels in Luke's account, why do you seek the living among the dead? Tombs are for dead people, and Jesus is no longer dead. Does Peter believe yet? No, but he's certainly chewing on it. The fact that John tells us in verse 8 that John saw and believed, it doesn't rule out the possibility that Peter believed at this point too, but I think what John has in mind here is designed to draw contrast. John believes now. Peter doesn't yet, but he's drawing closer because he's taking the time to see in a different way than just glancing lightly. He's studying the evidence, and it seems that by now there's perhaps a hint of an inkling, of an iota, of a thought. That maybe, just maybe, Jesus' body has not been stolen, but there's another possible explanation. My friends, this is how we are to examine the claims of the resurrection and of the gospel and of everything else we find in Scripture. We're not to give it a cursory glance without thought. We are to think about, we are to meditate on what we read. We are to seek to see more closely. On this Easter Sunday, what do you think about the facts of Jesus' resurrection? They are facts, you know. This is not some myth, some fairy story. John is giving us an eyewitness account. He was there that day. And he's also bringing in other eyewitnesses to the resurrection. Mary Magdalene, Simon Peter, Lately, later, Thomas and the other apostles. And this is not something that we can easily discount, at least if we're being honest. Billy Graham once said, There is more evidence that Jesus rose from the dead than there is that Julius Caesar ever lived or that Alexander the Great died at the age of 33. We don't doubt the reality of Julius Caesar, that he lived that he said, Veni, Vidi, Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. We don't doubt that. We don't doubt that Alexander the Great ruled over much of the ancient world. We accept the validity of their existence and their accomplishments. And yet there is so much more evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you're not one who has yet believed, look closely. Don't be such a doubter. 
That is, one who has made up his mind without actually looking closely at the claims of Scripture, the claims of Jesus, and of God's inspired word. Don't let someone else decide for you. You make an effort. Seeing that produces believing. Peter's observations that we've just read about may or may not have been accompanied by something he said to John at this point. Perhaps something that Peter said, or maybe even the time that it took to make a longer examining look, that made John reconsider. And at this point, John steps into the tomb for a second look. It's not enough to just stand on the outside and, and stoop down. He must see for himself. And so we read in verse 8, Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw and believed. For the third time in four verses, John writes, he saw. And for the third time in four verses, John uses a different Greek word that means to see. In verse 5, as John looks inside from the outside, see simply means take a look around, glance. In verse 7, as Peter comes into the tomb, see is a word meaning to examine closely. But in verse 8, as John now steps into the chamber that had once held the body of Jesus Christ, the apostle, looking back on his own eyewitness experience of that first Easter Sunday, he uses a word that means to experience, to see with perception, to see with spiritual eyes. And it's this kind of seeing that is followed with the words, and believed. Both Mary Magdalene and Simon Peter are on the way to believing. But John is the first to believe that Jesus has risen from the dead. Now, what did John see? I find it fascinating that at this point he, he has not yet seen Jesus. He hasn't with his own eyes seen the risen Lord. And John's narrative indicates that he won't until later that same day when Jesus enters the locked upper room to say to the disciples, peace be with you. Mary Magdalene will be the first to actually see her resurrected Lord, but John is the first to believe. What does it mean that John believed? He examined the facts about the resurrection and he trusted them. He leaned on his own experience. He had come to the tomb thinking, just like Mary, that someone had absconded with Jesus' body, that Jesus' body had been stolen. He had even looked briefly into the tomb without concluding that Jesus had risen. But then he went back, and he looked more closely. And as John processed what he saw, he concluded, Jesus has risen even before he actually saw the Lord. From that point on, John was never the same. And that was just as true for all the other disciples. Once they had seen the risen Lord, it's just as true for them as it was for John. John is the only one of the original 12 disciples who dies of old age. The others all died for their witness to and their belief in the Lord Jesus. And John died in exile, so he too was willing to die for what he believed. Now, what does this mean in our present day, in the midst of a pandemic? It doesn't mean recklessness. It doesn't mean that we throw caution to the wind and flagrantly violate the prudent precautions that those who are experts in dealing with a coronavirus have set in place. We live wisely, but we live in faith. That means we trust in God's plans for us for our safety, for our provision, for our security. Meaning that even if we were to test positive and be ushered out of this life, we belong to him. And as the Apostle Paul said, to live is Christ and to die is gain. It means that if we lose our jobs and find our finances stretched, we trust in God's promise. And my God will supply all my needs all your needs, according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Our faith is in Christ, far over and above our trust in anyone or anything else. We walk by faith. Jesus is alive, and we will reign with him, and nothing can separate us from his love. 
This is how John and Peter and the other apostles lived once they understood that Jesus was everything he said he was and that death and the grave could not hold him. The fact that Jesus was alive made all the difference to them and it should make all the difference to us as well. Even on the first Easter Sunday, there were plotters and schemers who tried to short-circuit the gospel by saying that Jesus' disciples had stolen the body, that they had stolen the body and hid it somewhere and were falsely proclaiming that Jesus had risen. My friends, how ridiculous that is. I mean, besides the fact that Pilate had ordered a Roman guard on the tomb, which certainly would have dissuaded a group of timid men who were quaking in fear behind closed doors. Oh yeah, sure, they're suddenly going to over, overpower the guards and steal Jesus' body. Besides that, we have this historical record that, that John was willing to die for his faith and go to exile, and all the others did die for their faith. Would they die for a lie? What they know was untrue? No! Not a chance. We read here that John saw and believed. He didn't yet have it all put together at this point. Look at what verse 9 says. It says that both John and Peter as yet did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. They they weren't working on full understanding yet. Even though Jesus had told them repeatedly that he would die and be raised in three days, they didn't understand yet. That's going to come later. We saw last week from our study of John 12 that it wasn't until Jesus was glorified until he had ascended into heaven and was seated at the right hand of God the Father, that their eyes were opened and they understood how it all fit together. But John, even at this point, had enough to believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And from this point on, he lived by his faith, even to exile and the threat of death. He saw and believed. Now here's the question I I told you I would ask you. Do you see? We're like John at this point in the narrative. We haven't seen the risen Jesus with our own eyes and neither had John. But he believed and lived out his faith in the risen Lord. We're called to see and believe in the same way. Belief in the risen Jesus and the Christian gospel, it changes everything. I was reading just this week about Charles Colson. Chuck Colson was one of President Nixon's hatchet men. That is, that is a term he used to describe himself. He was a hatchet man in the Watergate scandal. Like many others, he went to prison for his crimes. But in prison, he came to see that Jesus was real and he came to saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Jesus. Like John, he came to believe by examining the facts. In conclusion, hear his own words. Chuck Colson said, I know the resurrection is a fact, and Watergate proved it to me. How? Because 12 men testified that they had seen Jesus raised from the dead. Then they proclaimed that truth for 40 years, never once denying it. Everyone was beaten, tortured, stoned and put in prison. They would not have endured that if it were not true. Then he draws this comparison. He says, Watergate embroiled 12 of the most powerful men in the world and they couldn't keep a lie for three weeks. You're telling me 12 apostles could keep a lie for 40 years? Absolutely impossible. John and the other apostles concluded what we have come to believe by faith. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. Now let us, like them, walk by faith. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for opening our eyes to the glorious truths of the gospel. We serve a risen Savior. He is not dead. He has risen. And he has ascended to the right hand of you, the Father on high. And he rules forevermore. And we who trust in him will reign with him. This is good news. And it ought to be good news that we live by. Let us not live by fear. Let us live by faith. Let us walk by faith in the risen Lord.
Let us trust in your promises to us and live with vibrancy. For now, through your grace and your mercy, you have caused us to see. May we live as those who see and believe in the risen Christ. Amen and amen. He is risen. He is risen indeed. And now hear the benediction. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen and amen. Go in peace. Thank you.